The story you're about to hear is a compilation of documented true facts about historical characters, events, or locations. Please sit back and listen as I narrate this story to you. On June 30, 1999, a woman was driving through a rural area near West Alton, Missouri when she noticed something out of the ordinary just off the side of a quiet road near Route 367. That curious mess turned out to be Ricky McCormick's body lying face down in a cornfield. The police were well versed in the area which was known as a criminal dumping ground for bodies. Ricky McCormick, 41 years old, was a high school dropout who had lived in the greater St. Louis area at various addresses, living intermittently with his elderly mother. Ricky, who had chronic heart and lung issues, had not yet been reported missing. The fact that Ricky's body was discovered more than 20 miles from his home perplexed the investigators. Ricky didn't drive or own a car, and there was no public transportation in the area. He also didn't know anyone in the remote area. The only plausible explanation was that he was brought there by a third party. Ricky's body was discovered with two hand-scribbled notes found in his pocket. The notes appeared to have been written in 30 lines of coded text, including numbers, letters, and parentheses, and were not written in a language that the police could understand. The FBI believes the two notes may lead to those responsible for Ricky's death. Also, Ricky's body was badly decomposed, which was unusual given that the medical examiners believed he died only three days before his body was discovered and that the weather had not been unusually warm. His outstretched hand's flesh had rotten to the point where his fingertips just below the top knuckles had fallen off and lay next to him in the weeds. His fingerprints were still intact, allowing the police to easily identify him. His information was already on file due to previous interactions with the police. Ricky's death was suspected to have occurred elsewhere, according to the authorities. His body could have been kept in an outbuilding or a vehicle trunk until it was dumped, where it was later discovered. Ricky's advanced decomposition made an autopsy difficult. Pathologists with the St. Charles County Medical Examiner's Office ultimately ruled McCormick's cause of death undetermined after a thorough examination of the 72 pounds of bones and flesh that survived exposure to the elements. The authorities, on the other hand, considered the case a homicide even though there was no evidence that anyone had a motive to kill him, nor were there any weapons or witnesses to support that he had been murdered. The police determined that he died on June 27. His last known location was a trip to Wanamaco gas station earlier that day. On March 29, 2011, the FBI appealed to the public for assistance in solving the mystery surrounding the cryptic note discovered on Ricky. A few days later, they updated their website to reflect the outpouring of responses and created a separate page for the public to offer comments and theories. The FBI's Crypto Analysis and Racketeering Records Unit, or the CRRU, and the American Cryptogram Association have yet to decipher the perplexing note. The authorities believe that determining what is in the note will aid in the investigation of Ricky's murder. CRRU Chief Dan Olson believes that breaking the code could aid police in determining where Ricky was prior to his death. Olson suspects they are notes Ricky took for himself. He hopes the notes will help the police figure out what happened to Ricky and why. Cracking a code takes four steps. First one must determine the language used, in this case, English. Then, the system used, a cipher in which letters are transposed or substituted for something else, for example, or a code in which a letter such as R represents a person or place or perhaps even a secret language such as a version of Big Latin. After that, one must reconstruct the key that explains how the code maker changed the letters of the message, such as by shifting every character three letters to the right in the alphabet. Finally, one can apply the key and transcribe the intended text. We cannot get past two, Olson says of the McCormick case. Some have suggested that the notes are meaningless, that they are the random scribblings of a man who was functionally illiterate and had a low IQ. Olsen, on the other hand, is quick to argue the opposite. He believes the codes contain information about where McCormick was or who he met in the final hours 
before his body was left to rot along with his secrets. There are four major hypotheses. The first theory is that Ricky's assailant wrote the code and left it on Ricky's body to derail the investigation. Another theory is that Ricky was only semi-illiterate and didn't know what he was writing due to his mental illness and learning disability. Ricky, according to a third theory, was working as a courier, delivering encrypted messages to and from criminals. Most people believe Ricky wrote the note in a shorthand he developed over time. It's possible that the note will never be deciphered if this is the case. Ricky's shorthand would have been influenced by his learning difficulties and mental health, implying that anyone attempting to decipher the cipher would need to first learn Ricky's idiosyncratic private language. Perhaps the FBI is stuck on step one of deciphering the above-mentioned coded note, determining the language used, rather than step two, determining the system used, as they have suggested. There is some disagreement about whether Ricky's family believes he could write the cipher. Some members of Ricky's family claim that he couldn't read or write and that he couldn't have written such a complicated coded message. Ricky had been writing his own secret language since he was a child, according to other family members. Unfortunately, no samples of Ricky's handwriting exist. As a result, there is nothing with which to compare the note to determine whether Ricky was the author. Considering the above, it's hard to know what to think. Ilonka Dunin, a cryptographer, believes Ricky did not write the note. Ilonka suggests that after considering Ricky's education and background, he may have worked as a courier of coded messages for criminals. However, if Ricky was killed while couriering notes for nefarious people, it seems strange that the killer would have left the note on his body for the police to find. Ricky had a shady past, having pled guilty to statutory rape in the early 1990s. When he was 34 years old, he was arrested by St. Louis police for fathering two children with a girl under the age of 14. According to court documents, Ricky had been sleeping with the girl since she was 11 years old. Ricky's mother and aunt knew the girl simply by her nickname, Pretty Baby. Ricky may have been considered a simpleton who, despite some street smarts and a criminal record, was generally oblivious to the world. Andrew Jones, Ricky's girlfriend, told police that Ricky had made a couple of trips to Orlando, Florida to pick up marijuana for Baja Bob Hamdala, the owner of the gas station where Ricky worked. Ricky would accept money in exchange for picking up and delivering packages. He had previously visited Florida and had brought marijuana into the apartment he shared with Sandra in the Clinton Peabody Housing Project south of downtown on several occasions. Typically, the drugs would be sealed in Ziploc bags and rolled into basketball-sized bundles. According to the police report, Ricky told Sandra that he was holding the weed stashes for Baja Hamdala. Ricky never talked about his trips to Orlando, but is indifferent when he returned that last time, according to Sandra. He appeared to be terrified. This lends credibility to the theory that Ricky was involved in illegal activity at the time of his death. While there was no evidence of a motive, the police were aware of Baja's violent temper. He allegedly shot at people in the past when he became enraged with them. However, the police discovered nothing that led them to believe Baja was involved in Ricky's murder. Gregory Lamar Knox, a high-level drug dealer who operated in Ricky's neighborhood, was also a suspect in several homicides. He was already wanted for four murders in the area, and police suspected him of being responsible for Ricky's death as well. In fact, a confidential informant also told police that Knox was responsible for the murder of a black man who worked at the gas station on Chateau Avenue and whose body was dumped near West Alton. But police were unable to find any evidence linking Knox to Ricky's death. Ricky appeared afraid after his last return from Orlando on June 17, 10 days before his murder according to both his girlfriend and his aunt. Did Ricky realize he was in jeopardy? Ricky's family stated in 2012 that they did not believe he wrote the notes because he lacked the ability to create a code. His father and aunt thought he wasn't a good writer and might be dyslexic. Regardless of who wrote the cryptic note or why, Ricky and his loved ones have not received the justice that they deserve. If you have any information about Ricky's murder, please contact the St. Charles County Police Department hotline at 636 949 
3002. Rika's murder remains unsolved. Hey everyone, I just wanted to express how grateful I am that you took time out of your day to listen to my narration. This is Nikki of Twisted Mind and I'd like to wish you a wonderful rest of your day. Salamat.